Uh, several months ago, I had a sermon here, Why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. That was two or three years ago. Today, I want to talk about why I'm still a Seventh-day Adventist. Lots of things have happened in a short period of time. I'm speechless as I watch what's happening in the world around us, and I realize that big changes could happen very quickly. Is that right? Matthew 24 unfolds before our very eyes. And uh, the king of the north comes with great power, Daniel chapter 11. And he overcomes and passes over. And the 11th chapter of Daniel is, is in the process of being fulfilled right now, before our very eyes. I grew up in a little town in Idaho, Council, Idaho. My parents were Seventh-day Adventists. My father worked in a sawmill. As, I bo as a boy, I remember the whistle blowing at noon. Anybody ever live in a community like that? Sawmill community? Whistle blow at noon? Now, this is probably 60 years ago, 70 years ago, more than that. <laughs> the little town had probably about 500 people in it. And every day at noon, the whistle blew. And it was a time for a shift change or something like that. I'm not sure. A little Adventist church, about 25 or 30 people met together in an old house. And uh, the members were faithful to their mission. I can remember Sabbath school as a boy. Picture rolls. How many of you remember picture rolls? <laughs> You're dating yourself now. Picture rolls with Bible stories. David and Goliath, Joseph and his brothers, Noah and the flood, the creation of our world. Daniel in the lion's den, all those stories, they stuck with me through the years. All these things are still etched in my mind. At times, I was the only child in Sabbath school class. On Friday, the baths were taken, the shoes were shined, the food was, was prepared for Sabbath. It was, after all, the what day? The preparation day, right. And we readied ourselves for the Sabbath hours. I attended Gem State Academy in Idaho. How many of you have, know where Gem State Academy is? Caldwell, Idaho. Some of you have been there. Maybe some of you went. How many went to school there? Okay. Gem State Academy. I learned to work in the bake. Learned to work. I learned to work in the bakery. Okay. Uh, my first employer. And on the farm, godly teachers taught me about the sanctuary and about Jesus and about Sunday laws to come and about the millennium and a whole host of things. Walla Walla, Walla College was a sweet dream for me. How many of you went to Walla Walla College or attended there? Okay. Wow. Okay. Sweet dream for me. And then Loma Linda, where I learned to be a dentist. And I graduated from there in 1963. That's a long time ago. Some of you were not born yet. And all these teachers were impactful to my life. It was a natural thing for me to become an Adventist. Natural, going through this educational system. And... Uh, What advantages children can have if they go to a church school? How many of you attended a Seventh-day Adventist church school at one point or another? That's almost everybody. We could have a reunion here, couldn't we? Uh, our educational system was extremely important to me. We have a little school up here in Bisbee, Cochise Adventist Christian School. Um, and there's about 19 students there right now, or maybe 18 now, I think, 18 students. And uh, so uh, remember that when you give your offerings, it's a school that needs support of two churches. And those children have a blessed privilege. I can't look to a moment where a lightning bolt came, a blast came, and I was suddenly changed. I've often thought 
that I missed out on some things as I hear tremendous conversion stories, miraculous instantaneous deliverance from drugs and alcohol and, and tobacco and all those kind of things. But here I am. I don't have a time where I can point to that. Some of you have that same experience, I think. My only credential is Jesus, who has led me in, in sort of a sheltered way through my life to learn to love his word and his people. And I've been able to serve. I come to you here today as your servant. I pray that as we work together and serve our little community here, that uh, as we work and pray together and be a blessing to others around us. Why I'm still a Seventh-day Adventist. Three reasons I can identify with this morning. I'm still a Seventh-day Adventist because of Jesus and of grace, Jim. Jesus and grace. Jesus is coming. And that's what an Adventist is. The imminent return of Jesus in power and glory, magnificence, audible, visible. The Bible says every eye will see him. How do, we prepare, how do I prepare for an event like this? And your scripture reading this morning is a good indicator of how we can prepare. Let's, let's look at it again. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. I just love these verses. Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. There are overtones of the judgment here, right? In the day when I make up my jewels. When does God make up his jewels? It's in the judgment hour, right? A book of remembrance is brought out. Other books are there. The books were opened and the judgment was set. And uh, so we have a high priest in the heavens. That's the subject of the book of Hebrews. And learning how to cooperate with Jesus, our high priest who ministers today with even with his own blood as our high priest. Learn all you can about the judgment of the living, the blotting out of sins, the final atonement, the latter rain and the ceiling, the Sunday test, the loud cry. You can read about that in Great Controversy, pages 480 to 490. It's a wonderful thing. We're living in the hour of God's judgment. For the hour of his judgment is what? Come. Come. Okay. When this message goes forth, the message of three angels, the judgment is already in progress. Some have asked, well, how long has your church been in existence anyway? Talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church now. The real answer to that question is much longer than you think. We might be tempted to say, well, we're not quite as old as the Baptists or the Presbyterians or the Methodists, or the Lutherans, or, uh, well, surely not as long as the Catholic Church, right? So how really old is Adventism? Jude verse 14. Jude verse 14. This man is 5,000 years old now, and he was an Adventist. Jude verse 14. Here's what it says. It's all right next to Revelation. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. Amen. Wow. Here's a man who was an Adventist, an Adventist preacher, over 5,000 years old now, and still alive because God took him to heaven. And he was about 300 years old, and he's been there ever since. He had an important message for his day. He had probably a huge, huge family. 
and uh, he was saddened by how bad things got within just a few hundred years after the creation. How does the Lord view this kind of a message that Enoch bore? The Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints or angels. Let's look at how the Lord looks at this. Hebrews, to the left, just a few pages. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Right after Thessalonians. Hebrews 11, verse 5. I'd like to have you all see this. Here's what it says. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That kind of a message pleases God. <laughs> we have that message to bear to a world around us. He was, a, he was also a prophet. The Bible says in Revelation 19.10 that the testimony of Jesus is the what? Spirit of prophecy, the spirit of all, the, the, the wharf and the woof, the horsepower behind all prophecy is Jesus, right? The testimony of Jesus. The book is just loaded with things from the prophets, and all of them point, the Old Testament points forward to Jesus. And the New Testament tells us, tells us that he came and that he's coming again. Every single prophet of God bore a testimony of Jesus, and all, all of them spoke of either the first advent or the second advent, all of them. The New Testament just moves to the focal point, the second coming of Jesus. Yes, Enoch was an Adventist. And then some comforting words from John 14, 1 to 3. You all love this. You all, most of you can probably quote this by heart. Let's just look at it. John 14, verses 1 to 3. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you, and I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where you are, that, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus is the chief Adventist of all. And his last recorded words are found in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. Let's look at it. Revelation 22, verse 20. These are his last recorded words. He which testifies these things says, surely I what? Come quickly. Wow. And Jesus is looking forward to the second coming. I'm sure he is. He wants to come. He wants to take his people home. I'd like to have you notice with me a couple more texts about the Advent. This is why I'm still an Adventist. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. It says... <clears throat> For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of who? His Father. He'll come in the, I believe the Father's going to be there too. I think the hall of heaven will be opened when Jesus comes. It will be closed, I should say. Nobody there. All the angels, it says. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father and with his angels. And then he will reward every man according to his works. Over to the right to chapter 25 and verse 31. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels, how many of the angels? All the angels with him. And then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. And uh, he comes, this, this little verse here comes on the heels of the message to the ten virgins. We should take special attention to chapter 25, shouldn't we? The parable of ten virgins. And it gives us some warnings about being ready for Jesus to come. All the apostles, New Testament apostles, were Adventists. <laughs> I say that. All the New Testament apostles were Adventists. Can you say amen? amen. Paul, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. <laughs> the Lord himself will come, it says. And uh, 
Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. You know, the angels are Adventists too. Let's look at it. It's uh, 1 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, Acts 1, 9 to 11. Acts 1, verses 9 to 11. Uh, can we begin to appreciate one of these wonderful promises? Chapter 1 of Acts, verses 9 to 11. It says, And when he had spoken these words, these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they stood, looked, and stood, while they, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Two angels, right? In white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus. I love that little expression, this same Jesus. They had been with him for three and a half years, right? This same one that you saw taken away, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And John proclaimed the Advent message. He said, behold, he cometh with clouds. And who can finish that? Every eye will see him. I don't know how that's going to happen on a round world. I think God is big enough. He'll wrap himself around this globe. Every eye will see him when he comes. And Peter, 2 Peter 3, 9 to 14. I believe Peter was an Adventist. You want to claim these people? <laughs> these are wonderful people, right? They're some of the prophets who gave us this wonderful information. 2 Peter chapter 3. And I want to read... From verses 9 to 14, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, what does it say next? Will come. The Lord is not slack. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of the Lord, of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with, ferv with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. <clears throat> Even when we do communion service, the bread and the wine, these are symbols of the spilt blood and the broken body of Jesus. By the way, we're going to have a communion service. It'll be the third Sabbath in February. Third Sabbath in February. You can prepare for that. It's a time to prepare for. It's kind of like a little baptism. But notice 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six talks about the Advent in the communion service. It's 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. Here's what it says. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do sure show what? The Lord's death till he comes. Wow. In this service, we draw on the grace to prepare for the great event when Jesus comes again. The New Testament is primarily an Adventist book. If a person doesn't like this Adventist book, he should have to discard the whole New Testament because it all looks forward. Do you know there are 318 references in the New Testament to the second coming of Jesus, the second advent, in, in, the, in, 220, in 260 chapters? Wow, what an idea. And it's all here in the New Testament. I'm still a Seventh-day Adventist because of the gospel of Jesus. In it is the power of love and wisdom are put on full display. I'd like to just look at one text about that, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just pages, just a few pages to the left. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18.
It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is what? The power of God. And then verse 24. This is what the gospel is to us. Verse 24 says, for to them, but to them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. We could talk about more verses in, that uh, talk about uh, the, the power and the power of the gospel. In time and place, God visited this planet. And what a visit it was. All the accumulated wealth of eternity was poured out in one gift to this world for our benefit. 60 centuries of earth people. And it was at great risk. I don't know exactly what the risk is, but you'll read in Desire of Ages that what he did was a great risk. He did this for us. And Philippians 2, 5 to 9. Philippians 2, 5 to 9. Over to the right, just a few pages. It's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Philippians 2. Philippians 2, 5 to 9. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 9. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even to the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. It says he was obedient even unto death. Uh, why did he choose those words? He was obedient to the cross. You know, he promised in the covenant to redeem us, didn't he? And he didn't tell us a lie. He told us the truth. He was obedient to a promise that he made to us. I think that's such an amazing thing. And uh, how could you reject all that when you begin to understand it? The fall of our first parents, resent, parents resulted in unbelief. As a result, they lost the tree of life and settled for a lesser tree, a tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Gnostics, you've heard of them, those people. They lived in the first, second, and third centuries. Alexandria, Egypt was their head, headquarters. They settled for a knowledge and philosophy of Egypt. Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates. And some of these ideas were incorporated into the medieval church. A grand works program. Humanistic ideas. And passed some of those ideas on to her sons and daughters to this day. And yes, it was also a rejection of the tree of life. Doctrines which scorned the character of God, that's what the doctrine of Antichrist is, scorning the, the, the character of God. But the gospel neutralizes all of that. The pages of the Bible are leaves from the tree of life. You read about that in Healthful Living. The pages of the Bible are leaves from the tree of life. And they are for the healing of the nations. You think the nations need healing? Oh, yeah. One day it'll be all, all perfect. The last message of, the message of mercy to the world is, Behold the character of God. What a good God he is. And be changed by it. In the first angel's message, the Sabbath is quoted, Worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is. Sabbath is a sign of the true gospel. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and sea. What an idea. And uh, give him all the glory. Fear God and give glory to him. He's our redeemer. Nothing in my hand I bring but simply to what? Thy cross I cling. And when I'm confronted with the cross, my hands go up in the air and say, I give up. Lord, now it's all of you and none of me. 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from where? The mouth of God. You know, just by some, some uh, coincidence, that verse is found in Matthew 4.4 4 and also Luke 4.4. 4. Did you know that? Matthew 4.4 4 and Luke 4.4. 4. And the Sabbath is the sign of righteousness which comes by faith. Ezekiel 20, 12, and 20. I gave them my Sabbath that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. It's the sign of righteousness by faith. When you keep Sabbath holy, you're saying, yes, Lord, you're my all in all. You're the one who makes me ready for your coming. Somewhere I want to go to another powerful text. It's in John 15, 5. We won't go there in the interest of time. But he says, without me, you can do what? Nothing. So don't settle for a false gospel. And the third reason why I'm still an Adventist is because of the remnant concept. Do you know what I mean by that? Revelation chapter 12, 17 talks about the remnant, which keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy, by the way. And... Uh, the remnant of what? We could ask that question. The remnant of what? The remnant of the first century church that Jesus founded. It's all there in the New Testament. Book of Acts, and on down to the letters of Paul, we find the belief system of the first century church. Do you know what? All 28 fundamentals are there. And the remnant church will look just like that in demeanor and belief. That's what a remnant is. It's what's left of the great bowl of cloth, right? The remnant concept is involved in the accumulation of truth that was the doctrine of the apostles. And because of that, they proclaimed it to the world. And in one generation, the world was was filled with gospel truth. The remnant concept is the accumulation of truths developed in the first century by Jesus himself, given to the apostles and, complained, and, and proclaimed worldwide in the first century. And by 62 AD, Paul could say the gospel has gone to every creature under heaven. They didn't have radios and televisions and electronic material and computers. Talk about 28 fundamentals. They're all there in the book of Acts and the letters of Paul. The remnant is the final generation who still teach these things. That's unselfish service, righteousness, truthfulness, love for God and fellow men, following Jesus. Look at them. They're there in Revelation 14, 1 to 5, a description of the 144,000. These are the people who comprise the remnant. And their message is a message of three angels, the verses that follow that description. And then in verse 14 of that same chapter, Jesus is coming. The last group of people on the earth before Jesus comes. So what are the great pillars of the remnant? Sabbath, spirit of prophecy, Sanctuary, second coming, service to others, state of the dead. There are six S's here, six S's. And I want to add a seventh one for good measure, and that is the judgment in connection with the 2300 days. Russ, we studied about that, didn't we? It's a major Bible doctrine teaching. So here we are today, living in the days which the apostles and prophets looked forward to. They longed to see our day. What a privilege we have. So let's savor it every single day. Eternity will soon start when Jesus comes. Take care of the important things. You all know what they are, don't you? Take care of the important things. Soon Jesus will come. And so I guess we could say this, even so come Lord Jesus. His last words 